in my younger years, when I still had two perfectly good functioning legs, I was pretty heavily involved in rugby and spent some of my time as post kicker for different teams. Kind of like the place kicker in football, if you're not familiar with rugby. The amount of force generated by the knee extensors and hip flexors to propel the ball is pretty incredible and recruits some of the strongest muscles in the body to accomplish this feat. This is the principal focus of today's study of the anteromedial compartments. Good day, and welcome to this relatively brief lesson on the anteromedial thigh. A much shorter lesson than what you're used to, which I'm sure is a welcome change. But with the volume of dissection that will be taking place over the next few days, the pace of the lectures needs to slow down in order to accommodate. Wouldn't be a bad idea to incorporate some of those kinesthetic learning exercises to ensure that you have a grasp on the material. Now, in the previous class, we discussed the framework of the thigh by looking at the os coxae in the femur. This lesson builds onto that framework by looking specifically at the anterior and medial compartments of the thigh. Posterior compartment will be covered in the following lesson. We'll start with an overview of the three compartments and their properties, and then we'll discuss the muscles found in each of these compartments. We'll then finish off with a look at the neurovascular supply to anterior and medial compartments. As previously mentioned, the superficial fascia projects a deep to form intermuscular septa that divides the thigh and leg into distinct compartments. In the case of the thigh, we can identify three distinct compartments containing muscles with a common function, vascular supply, and innervation. These are the anterior compartment, primarily involved in knee extension and innervated by the femoral nerve, the medial compartment, involved in adduction of the thigh at the hip and innervated by the obturator nerve, and the posterior compartment, involved in hip extension and knee flexion, which is innervated by branches of the sciatic nerve. In addition, we again have a distinct neurovascular compartment, which begins anteromedially in the superior part of the thigh, but courses posteriorly in the inferior region of the thigh to enter the leg. This orientation places slack on the compartment and flexion of both the thigh and knee and offers a degree of protection from mechanical trauma, similar to what was seen in the axilla. Again, this is a good summary slide to refer back to in order to maintain focus on the big picture. The principal muscle of the thigh is the quadriceps femoris muscle. As the name implies, it's composed of four separate heads, all of which insert on the superior border of the patella as the quadriceps femoris tendon. The patella serves as a sesamoid bone, forcing the tendon of the quadriceps anterior and increasing its mechanical advantage. Although not exactly part of the anterior compartment, this is not a bad time to introduce the iliopsoas muscle, as you will encounter its distalmost portion, where it inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. It's actually a fusion of two separate muscles, the iliacus laterally, which originates off the medial surface of the ilium, and the psoas major muscle medially, which originates off the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. The muscle passes anterior to the hip and is the principal flexor of the hip. Getting back to the quadriceps femoris muscle, the most distinct of the four heads is the rectus femoris. Of the four heads, rectus femoris is the only one to cross both the hip and knee, originating off the anterior inferior iliac spine just above the superior ridge of the acetabulum. As such, it also contributes to hip flexion. The remaining three bellies are not as distinct as the rectus femoris, but instead blend into one another. These are collectively known as the vastus muscles. The rectus femoris lays in a groove generated by the blending of these three muscle bellies, like a hot dog wrapped in a bun. The mid portion of the vastus musculature is known as the vastus intermedius. It lies deep to the rectus femoris with a broad insertion off the anterior aspect of the thigh. Vastus medialis lies medial and anterior to the intermedius, creating the medial lip of the hot dog bun. It has a long, narrow origin off the medial portion of the linea aspera. Its insertion is distinct, as a massive portion of the terminal fibers insert obliquely on the medial side of the patella. As a result, these fibers are often called the vastus medialis obliquus, or VMO for short. They play an important role in maintaining proper alignment of the patella and counter the pull of the iliotibial band, which attaches laterally. Note that while the VMO is given this special distinction, it is not a separate muscle, but a subregion of the vastus medialis. 
Finally, the vastus lateralis can be seen lateral to the rectus femoris. Similar to the vastus medialis, it has a long origin off the lateral lip of the linea aspera. The last muscle of the anterior compartment is the sartorius. The sartorius has the distinction of being the longest continuous muscle in the body. Its fibers originate off the ASIS and spiral medial and inferior to cross posterior to the knee. From there, the fibers change direction to come anteriorly to insert on the medial aspect of the knee. Sartorius is a Latin term meaning tailor. The tailor muscle, as it's known, gets its name because of the fact that medieval tailors would work while sitting in a cross-legged position, and the sartorius plays a role in each of these motions, flexion at both the hip and knee, and external rotation at the hip. We next move to the medial compartment. The muscles here are innervated by the obturator nerve and serve as hip adductors primarily. The first muscle in this group plays a dual role in both the anterior and medial compartments as it rests in the border between the two compartments and receives dual innervation from both the femoral and obturator nerve. This is pectineus. It originates from the superior ramus of the pubis and inserts on the pectineal line of the femur, just distal to the lesser trochanter. It's primarily an adductor muscle, but also plays a role in thigh flexion. Deep two pectineus is the obturator externus muscle, which originates off the obturator membrane to insert on the trochanteric fossa medial to the greater trochanter. It serves as a lateral rotator and stabilizer of the hip. The next two muscles have similar origins and insertions. The adductor longus originates off the anterior body of the pubis and inserts on the linea aspera just behind vastus medialis. The adductor brevis also originates off the anterior body of the pubis and inserts on the linea aspera. As the name implies, adductor longus attaches more distally and is therefore the longer of the two muscles. Note also that there is a small amount of overlap between adductor longus and brevis. The superior border of adductor longus lies adjacent to the inferior border of pectineus. Adductor longus and pectineus must be spread like a set of curtains to expose the adductor brevis muscle posteriorly. The largest muscle of the medial compartment is the aptly named adductor magnus. Like pectineus, it's somewhat of a hybrid muscle. Its adductor portion is innervated by the obturator nerve and acts with the medial compartment musculature. In addition, a hamstring portion has been identified that receives its innervation from the posterior compartment and assists the posterior compartment musculature. Both portions originate off the inferior rami off the rami and pubic bones. The adductor portion has an extensive insertion on the linea aspera, posterior to adductor longus and brevis. The hamstring portion runs almost vertical to insert on the adductor tubercle above the medial epicondyle. The division between the adductor and hamstring portions creates an archway over an opening, the adductor hiatus, which serves as a channel for neurovascular structures passing between the anterior compartment of the thigh and posterior compartment of the lower leg. The final muscle on the list is gracilis. The name is a Latin term for slender, which describes the thin appearance of this muscle. It arises off the anterior surface of the pubic body and projects inferiorly as the most medial of the medial compartment muscles. It passes posterior to the knee, then wraps anteriorly to insert on the tibia, just posterior to the sartorius muscle. Its principal function is as an inductor of the hip, but as it also passes posterior to the knee joint, it also serves as an accessory knee flexor. Before we can discuss the neurovascular supply to the lower limb, we need to identify their axis point. In the arm, that was the axillary space. In the case of the lower limb, we have the femoral triangle, so named for its three boundaries, the sartorius laterally, the adductor longus and pectineus medially, and the inguinal ligament superiorly, which also forms a bridge under which the neurovascular structures pass between the lower limb and abdominal pelvic cavity. The floor of the triangle is formed by the iliopsoas muscle and the roof is covered by the fascia lata. The contents of the triangle, from lateral to medial, are the femoral nerve, femoral artery, femoral vein, and the lymphatics separated by an empty space. The mnemonic navel, N-A-V-E-L, is often used to remember this association, nerve, artery, vein, empty, lymphatics.
Note that the latter three structures are encased in an extension of the superficial fascia known as the femoral sheath, but that the femoral nerve is external to this. From a surface anatomy perspective, the femoral triangle is an important landmark. In the case of severe bleeds in the lower limb, pressure to the femoral triangle, where the femoral artery pulse can be palpated, can temporarily restrict blood flow to prevent excessive losses in blood volume. We're going to take a look at the principal arterial supply to the lower limb, but first, let's back up a second to review the vascular supply in the pelvis. You should remember from the previous session that we had the descending aorta split into the common iliac, which in turn splits into the internal and external iliac artery. The external iliac artery is the branch that passes through the femoral triangle where it becomes the femoral artery. We'll be looking at this vessel in more depth in just a moment. Also recall the presence of the obturator artery off the internal iliac artery. This will project through the obturator canal to supply blood to the superior portion of the medial compartment of the thigh. The femoral artery, found almost centrally in the femoral triangle, is the principal arterial supply to the lower limb. As it courses through the femoral triangle, it provides some initial branches, including the superficial epigastric, superficial circumflex inguinal, and external pudendal arteries before passing deep to sartorius to enter the anterior compartment. It courses through the compartment in a crevice between the vastus medialis medially and the adductor longus and magnus laterally, called the adductor canal. The artery then passes through the adductor hiatus to continue into the lower leg. Early on, the femoral artery gives off the profunda femoris, which lies between the anterior and medial compartments and supplies the majority of blood to each. Similar to the upper limb, two branches off the profunda femoris wrap around the proximal portion of the femoral neck to supply blood to this region. These are the medial and lateral humeral circumflex arteries. They supply blood to the intertrochanteric mass of bone as well as the proximal humeral head. The lateral humeral circumflex continues to divide, providing three distinct branches. The ascending branch supplies the region surrounding the hip, the transverse branch is specific to the proximal head of the femur, and the descending branch supplies the lateral part of the anterior compartment. As the profunda brachia continues through the deep portion of the anterior compartment, it gives off three to four perforating branches that penetrate the medial compartment to provide vascular supply to the posterior compartment. This arrangement is vital to maintaining blood flow to the posterior compartment in a sitting position. A single vessel lying perpendicular to the direction of pressure from the sitting surface would compress the vessel and restrict blood flow to the lower compartment, preventing us from maintaining a seated position for more than just a few minutes. By having the principal blood supply course anteriorly, blood flow is allowed to continue into the leg region. And by having several vessels lying parallel to the line of force, more blood is able to reach the posterior compartment, allowing you to sit for long periods of time with only limited restrictions in blood flow. Finally, we consider innervation to this region. The anterior compartment is supplied by the femoral nerve, which already branches extensively before entering the femoral triangle. These motor branches supply the muscles within the anterior compartment. As stated in the first few minutes of the podcast, the terminal branch off the femoral nerve is the saphenous nerve, which travels with the femoral artery in the adductor or subsartorial canal, but pierces the skin between sartorius and gracilis tendons to enter the lower leg. The obturator nerve is a branch off the lumbosacral plexus that enters the medial compartment of the thigh, along with the obturator artery and nerve which supplies some additional blood to this compartment. The neurovascular bundle can be seen lying on top of the adductor brevis muscle. That concludes this podcast for the anterior and medial thigh. In the next lesson, we'll consider the posterior compartment of the thigh, as well as take a look at the posterior aspect of the knee. This is a region known as the popliteal fossa. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.